day to all our viewers. My name is Dr. Nisi Chusi from Ashes to Beauty A to B. This is another season. We are now talking human right statelessness. Statelessness. That's what we are talking. I've got an expert here with me, a lady who will unfold it, who will explain to us until we all understand and we know who we are, our citizenship our nationality. A very good day to you today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Nisi. That's wonderful. Please tell our viewers at home who you are and the organization that you come from. My name is um, Tandega Chauke. I'm the manager of the Statelessness uh, Project at Lawyers for Human Rights. Lawyers for Human Rights is an independent um, human rights organization with a 40-year track record of human rights activism mm -hmm. and public interest litigation. Um, our work spans over about five main programs, an environmental rights program, a land and housing program, a penal reform program, a gender equality program, as well as a refugee and migrant rights program. And under the refugee and migrant rights program is the Statelessness um, Project, which is a specialized unit that deals with issues related to access to nationality, um, access to documentation and other citizenship related um, matters. What is interesting, you said a word there, project. Mm. Why is it now a project if it's part of your company? Mm. So it was established as a project in 2011 when we started receiving a lot of clients and a number of clients with issues related to documentation and issues related to citizenship. And it was established as a project um, because um, of the nature of the problem of statelessness. It, it required, um, you know, specialist attention. Right. Yes. Before we even go further, I'm switching on my television and I'm hearing statelessness. Mm. Let's define that. Unfold it for somebody who have never heard such a word. Mm. What is it? So statelessness does sound like this um, legally ambiguous concept, but it's actually mm. something that is more common than we think. And it is something that can affect anyone. Um, the legal definition of what statelessness is, is um, any person who is not, um, who's not recognized as a national of any country in the world. So yeah. essentially, you become a foreigner everywhere you go, and you're a national nowhere. You don't belong anywhere, essentially. So what do you mean? You don't belong anywhere. Mm. Somebody mm. is born somewhere. What happened in that process? So statelessness is... A legal concept okay. so while someone might be um, you know born in a specific place and believe that they belong in that place mm -hmm. so long as the laws of that country do not recognize you as a citizen this is how you can become stateless essentially it can have very adverse um, consequences for a person mm -hmm. no. because if you think of um, any opportunity in which you have to present a form of identity document for example going to the bank um, for example, signing a lease agreement and enrolling for, um, you know, a course at school. Yeah. That is something that becomes impossible for a person who's stateless. Yeah. Because when you're stateless, you also don't have documentation. Right. Mm. It's a fact. We do have such people everywhere. You find children are also born in one country and they, they actually, the parents belong to another country. Mm. Who belongs where? Mm. What is your nationality in that area? So in terms of who decides who belongs, in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, who confers citizenship on people, yeah. that is the responsibility of, you know, each state. Okay. Each state has that power to create, um, you know, citizenship laws which dictate how someone can acquire citizenship. Mm -hmm. So um, statelessness, the causes of statelessness, one of those is where there's a conflict in those nationality laws. Because remember, the laws will have different citizenship laws. Yeah. For example, yeah. in South Africa, they might say for you to be South African, you must be born in South Africa to a South African parent. Oh, for example, right. in America, for you to become American, you don't necessarily need to be born to American parents, you just need to be born on American soil. Oh, so where there's a conflict or gaps mm -hmm. in those um, applications of citizenship laws, you can find a person who falls through those gaps and finds themselves stateless. Of course, mm. we do have people in our country, which is South Africa, and the parents are not from South Africa, kids are born in this mm. where do the kids belong so in south africa our citizenship law is quite um if i can use the word generous because we use both principles 
the principle of being born to a South African, which is called youth sanguine. So you attain South African citizenship by blood. Okay. Um, and that is um, regardless of where you are born. Mm. So whether you're born in South Africa or in Botswana, but you have a South African parent, you will get South African citizenship. Right. The other form is um, youth soli, where you're born on the territory. So if you're mm. born in South Africa, there's also a provision for you in terms of our citizenship laws to acquire South African citizenship. Mm. But of course, that comes with additional conditions. It's not, it's not as simple as um, you know, simply being born in South Africa. Mm. Um, the law is saying that you must be born in South Africa. Your birth in South Africa must be registered, which means that you need a birth certificate. And it also um, requires you to apply for citizenship when you turn 18. So you have to yeah. wait until you turn 18, then you can submit um, that application. And then there are other procedural um, barriers that can make it difficult for someone to simply acquire citizenship through that route. But the fact is that the citizenship laws do allow for it. But now I'm thinking about these kids that are born here. They do not have any documentation to prove that they were born in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And now you do your grade 12 and you're 16. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that gap? Because now between 16 and 18, you have to wait until you're 18 to apply, but you're 16. Mm -hmm. And in your matric, you need a documentation to write your exams. How do we deal with such? Okay, so that is also um, another cause of statelessness mm -hmm. where there is a lack of access to documentation. So being undocumented is not the same as being stateless because um, being undocumented mm. simply mean, it can mean that perhaps you lost your documentation, right, yes, but course. it doesn't mean that you can't access it. You can lose it and then you can go to the Department of Home Affairs and apply for the reissue of things like your ID and your birth certificate. Mm. A person who is undocumented and they don't have um, the option of approaching their local authorities for the reissue of those documents is at risk of statelessness. Mm. Yes. So what happens with um, children in those circumstances um, is that they wouldn't have been able to access birth registration at the point that they would have been born for various reasons. Mm -hmm. For example, there are many um, procedural barriers to birth registration in South Africa. One of the common ones is the fact that your parents have to be documented in order for you to be, to be registered and to acquire a birth certificate. So if you are a child born to an undocumented South African or um, a South African with a blocked ID, South African without a valid um, form of identity, it might mean that you won't get your birth certificate. If you're born to an irregular migrant, so a migrant who has come into South Africa um, without following the proper immigration process, that can also land you in a situation where you're at risk of statelessness. And the provisions in the law that we apply as lawyers for human rights when we have clients that approach us with these problems is that the first thing that we try to do is get the birth of the child registered. You have to start with birth registration and then build on from that to see what options to documentation the child will have. Um, we're fortunate that South Africa has a late registration of birth process. Oh, wow. So even if you've now turned 16 and you haven't done your birth registration, you can still do it through the late registration of birth process. Once you've done that, we can assess what your documentation options are. If you're born to migrant parents, we must also see if um, in the country of origin of your parents, for example, if your parents are from you know, Zambia, yeah. you must see if it's possible for you to still acquire Zambian um, citizenship. If you cannot um, acquire Zambian citizenship, then your options are to acquire South African citizenship by virtue of the fact that you were born in South Africa. But in that period between the birth of the child and when they turn 18, because like we said, one of the conditions yeah. is that you must turn 18, we have to find other um, you know, immigration options for the child. Mm -hmm. Within that period, the child might be able to apply, for example, for a study permit to at okay. least be, um, to have legal status in South Africa until they turn 18. And if you're a child of, South, of a South African, um, of course, it's more direct. You can, you can always assert your citizenship at any point. Um, if you cannot get a birth certificate or an ID, it's usually just an administrative um, you know, like barrier that we can always assist with. We can intervene and engage with the Department of Home Affairs. Under normal circumstances, that process, mm. how long does it take? It can take any amount of time. Any amount of time. We um, have some cases that have gone on for years. No. <laughs> we recently had a constitutional court judgment for five of our clients, mm. and I think that case would have, you know, started maybe eight years ago for us to fi find a final resolution. Mm. Um, but that's only if you have to go to court. Some of these issues we can resolve them by um, engaging with the Department of Home Affairs. Mm. But each case is different. So each case is different, and we can't really put a timeline as to when. Um, 
this, this situation can be resolved. But it also speaks to the lack of um, direct laws in South Africa that deal with statelessness. So statelessness is a global issue. Yeah. It's a global issue and there are two United Nations conventions that um, speak directly to the issues of how you can identify a stateless person, what you can do to protect a stateless person, and also how you can reduce statelessness and eventually eradicate it to, you know, to, to end statelessness. Yeah. Um, so South Africa hasn't signed those two conventions. If they do sign those two United Nations conventions, it means that they can then make domestic laws that speak directly to statelessness. But what we are, we, we do have in South Africa is the constitution. All right, yeah. We have the constitution and even our laws that speak to citizenship, our laws that speak to birth registration are very, um, you know, very progressive laws. But it, implementation of those laws then comes into the way of us being able to handle statelessness directly which is why if South Africa signs the United Nations conventions to require them to have specific acts that speak to statelessness and that cover the gaps that the constitution and our other domestic laws don't cover. Sure. Mm. This thing is it's just a serious thing but and it affects everybody. I'm sitting at home at a law company mm. and I'm thinking costs. Everybody thinks law mm -hmm. thing costs. Who can or can the company Anybody, a normal person anyway, can just walk in or do you need to have a specific budget? If mm. it takes eight years, it takes ten years. And the cost associated with the case also takes ten years or eight years. Mm. So Lawyers for Human Rights, we are non-profits. Right. So uh, we give legal services pro bono, All on right. a pro bono basis. Yes. Um, the then litigation. who qualifies for that? So we do have a means test. All right. We do target more vulnerable populations, so that means if you're, you know, poor, indigent, marginalized, we will assist you. Um, the issue is that in South Africa, there, there is a bit of a legal gap in terms of um, where or options for legal assistance for people yeah. with these issues, because it's not it's not an area of law that's broadly practiced. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that we have actually um, convened a network on statelessness in South mm -hmm. Africa. And this network comprises of, you know, lawyers, of yeah. journalists, of paralegals. And um, our, our aspiration is to start to empower other people in civil society or even in private sector yeah. to be able to understand what statelessness is and how to intervene on behalf of people that um, have these issues. We also empower um, affected persons themselves as to how to go about resolving a particular issue. For example, if you have a blocked ID, yeah. you can come to us and we can give you advice of the steps that you need to take to have the ID unblocked. And if you feel like you have then um, you know, hit a brick wall and you can't take it further, you can come back to Lawyers for Human because Rights. normally that's mm. the challenge. We go to the wrong places mm. for the right thing that we're looking for. Mm. Yeah. So if anyone does have a challenge mm. i think lawyers for human rights is your first port of call if yeah. you can contact us we can then refer you mm. to someone if we are not close to you we can refer you to someone who is close enough to you who might be able to um to assist and the reason why i say close enough is because the statelessness project is currently only based in johannesburg oh, right. although yeah. we do have um we do take on cases across south africa okay. um but like I said, we're working in this network with our other partners that might also be able to assist someone who is in a remote area or in a different province. Yeah. Yes. They are myth about this thing. One will say, no, because you are from this other area mm -hmm. of Africa. The other one will say, no, but do they take care of the Zen people? The other one mm -hmm. will say, no, but Nigerians are better. Who really um, qualifies? Who really find help? Who really must go to you guys mm. to get this help? As you said, the parents, if the parents belong here, the parents don't belong here. Mm -hmm. So this is there's a case here, and there's a way that you must select who to help. Mm. Who do you really assist? We assist. Case? We try to assist everyone who needs mm. help. Um, if we can't mm. help, it's mm. probably a capacity issue. But yeah. there's no sort of differentiation between citizens mm. and non-citizens. All right. Because this is statelessness mm. is one of those things that actually affects anyone. And in South Africa, it affects both South African citizens and mm. migrants. Okay. So there's no need for us to differentiate between who we assist, because it is really something that can affect anyone. Okay. Mm. It does. Sure. I'm like thinking now, 
there am I, I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking, I don't even have money. So now we know we've got a solution for that because this is a pro bono company. Mm -hmm. But now, where it is from here, the first time I landed in South Africa, they stole my bag. I don't have a reference point. Mm -hmm. I don't have any document. Where to? Where to? So the first um, point, port of call, if you yeah. are a migrant, yeah. um, you can get assistance, for example, from your embassy or consulate. If you can trace down, if you're Zimbabwean, you can try and trace down the Zimbabwean consulate or the Zimbabwean embassy. Mm -hmm. If you do come to Lawyers for Human Rights, we can also assist you in terms of where do you need to go, which relevant authorities do you need to uh, approach. We can even intervene on your behalf to write to the embassy to say, listen, we have um, the citizen from your country and this is their issue, what can they do from here to get assistance? Yeah. Yes. The challenge which is the most one are the students, the learners. Mm -hmm. You have said it that they sometimes get a permit mm -hmm. so they can study. But these young ones that they don't even know what to do, how do you handle the little children? I mean, I mean from the age of 0 to 10, let's say 0 to 10. Mm -hmm. How do you handle those kids? So then I go back to the Constitution of South Africa. If you look at Section 28 of the Constitution, which deals specifically with children's rights, um, it doesn't differentiate between children who are South African children and children who are um, children of you know non-citizens. Yeah. It confers rights on every child in South Africa. Right. And one of those important rights is the right to basic education. We have, um, you know, we are aware of challenges in schools mm -hmm. where principals will issue letters to parents to say the child doesn't have a birth certificate. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you don't resolve this within three months, we are sending the child home. Mm. Recently, we had a high court judgment in the high court of Makanda, which confirms that every child, mm -hmm. even undocumented children, yeah. are entitled to the right to basic education. Mm -hmm. So what we then do, because we have now this judicial precedent, is that we explain this to schools, we explain this to the Department of Basic Education, mm -hmm. that these children, even if they're undocumented, should be permitted to come and learn. Because we know the impact of education. You know, education. I'm laughing because now the child is walking in mm. and they're claiming the child is 10. Yes. Because the child needs to be in grade what six or seven yes but yes. the child looks 15 and yes. you can tell that the child is 15. yes so you're saying now the school must sit with the child that doesn't even have an id mm. with nothing indeed they must and for the issue of age determination yeah. the children's court can actually um do an assessment of a child's age if there is a question right. as to the child's age yeah. they can conduct a, an age determination okay. for the child but the point is that um the issue of documentation shouldn't come into the way of the child having the opportunity to yeah. learn, okay. you know, because they, that can have, um, you know, negative consequences for a child. If you don't have education, you don't have the tools to empower yourself and, you know, to, to carve out a, a positive future as an adult. Mm. So this is why education is one of those fundamental human rights that children should never be deprived of, no matter what the circumstances are. And you'd, you'd even be um, surprised to note that in the specific case, the High Court case I just mentioned, that confirms the rights of every child to education, the Department of Basic Education, in fact, um, they brought the stats of undocumented learners that they had enrolled in public schools in 2019. It was almost 900,000 undocumented learners, mm. and out of those um, 900,000, 800,000 were actually South African citizens. So this also goes to demonstrate that this is not a foreign issue. It's actually more closer to home than we think. So it's South African children are just as affected as children of migrants. But in any case, we shouldn't be differentiating between children. When we speak about children's rights, we must include all children. All children mm. in the country. Yes. Oh my goodness. This is a serious issue. Whether you belong or you do not belong. But today you have found a solution. Our aspect here with us is giving you all the information. If you follow through the right processes, you will find yourself at the right place. There's always a place. There's mm. always a, a number. There's always, if somebody's sitting at home and saying, who do I contact? Mm. They're looking at you now. They're saying, okay, the information is excellent and I am in that situation. Where do they contact you? Where do they go to find information? 
So Lawyers for Human Rights' website has a lot of information and also mm. links to our social media pages, our Facebook page mm. and our Twitter page which always has updated information. So if you visit um, www.lhr.org.za you can also um, find... Let, let's say that again <laughs> so that people can hear. Okay, www.lhr.org.za yes. mm-hmm. Right. You can also find, um, you know, contact details for specific people. If you would like to reach the Statelessness Project, you'll find our details there. There are also other organizations that you can also um, look up online, such as the Scalabrini Center. They are based in um, Cape Town. The NMMU Refugee Rights Unit, they are based in the Eastern Cape. And the UCT um, Refugee Rights Center are based in the Western Cape. And also organizations such as ProBono.org, or legal aid. Right. And then you've touched a lot of children. Now I'm interested in these two people which are called Parent. Mm. Parent is a South African. Mm. The father is not a South African. Then who gives the right? Who can apply for a child to have a citizenship? So in South Africa, mm-hmm. um, either parent oh. can confer citizenship on the child. Okay. So it would then depend on what nationality, what specific nationality the father is. Right and whether the the nationality laws of the country that he is from also give him the right to to pass on citizenship to the child. It must also require you to look at where the child is born because um, the the nationality laws of the father's country might say that if the child is not born in our country, we are not giving him citizenship. Yes, but at least with South Africa, no matter where you're born, so long as you have a South African parent, just one South African parent, you can claim South African citizenship from that. Okay, so you just need one parent who's a South African parent mm. and can apply. Yes. Then there's a parent who's not a South African parent, but he's been here for 40 years, mm-hmm. so that matter. And the child is born here. Mm-hmm. Where does the child live? The child can again claim South African citizenship by virtue of being born here, yeah. but then they must satisfy those additional conditions that we've mentioned in our discussion birth registration, yeah. and um, as well as turning 18, and then they of required documentation that they must also put together to prove that they've been living in South Africa. So it can be like a school record to show that these are the schools the child has attended, etc. Um, alternatively, we we must also look at the father's um, citizenship. If the father has lived in South Africa for 40 years, yeah. does it mean that um, you know the father has now acquired South African citizenship through some other route? Or From d- what you're saying, mm. how long does it take one to acquire South African citizenship? If you are a migrant. Yeah. So your options vary. Okay. For example, if you're going to come to South Africa to seek um, refuge, oh, asylum. Right, yeah. If you're going to come into South Africa to seek mm-hmm. asylum, your process will start with an asylum seeker permit. Mm-hmm. If your asylum claim is validated and confirmed, you will then get a refugee permit. Right. If you're on a refugee permit for a particular number of years, mm-hmm. that's usually um, determined by the Department of Home Affairs, I believe it's five mm-hmm. years, then you can apply to naturalize, um, mm-hmm. you, know, you can apply to, to become a permanent resident. Mm-hmm. Right. Then if you're a permanent resident for five years, you can apply to naturalize into a South African citizen. Where do people go to mm. become permanent? Because like a uh, permanent resident, people they go in the wrong places. Mm. And then they're like, but when I go to home affairs and they turn me back, mm. where must they go? They must look on the Department of Home Affairs website. Right. It has quite a lot of you know, comprehensive information about the processes, what documents um, they will require from you and which local office you can go to. So the PR applications are processed in the local offices. So you'll just be required to approach the, the Department of Home Affairs that is closest to you and they'll be able to give you further guidance. Um, but you know, institutions or organizations like Lawyers for Human Rights are also able to give um, you know, guidance and advice as to where to look, what documents you will need, whether or not you will qualify, and you know, which, which Home Affairs office to approach. What is this fear with people to say now, if I come out and say, you know, I'm from Zim and I don't have any qualification, oh, sorry, not qualification, mm-hmm. I don't have any documentations, then I'll be arrested. Is there such a thing that you get arrested just for not belonging to the mm-hmm. country? I mean, it is such a thing because yeah. the law does, um, it does give the powers to law enforcement to r- right. request identity documents. Okay. And if you can't produce an identity document, they also um, have the authority to arrest you. Um, mm. And they, they might be able to arrest you for purposes of deportation, 
but um, this then it, it depends on on what the, the laws in relation to detention and immigration say. You can't be detained for a certain period of time, well over a certain period of time, and then, I mean, if the deportation can't be processed, then they have to release you. So for example, a stateless person can't be detained for deportation, because if they're stateless, they can't be deported. Um, but we do often get clients who have been in that unfortunate position and we have to intervene and explain and explain the laws you have said a mouthful. I want you in a bullet point just to mention exactly what were you saying. <laughs> You've said a lot, I've learned a lot, but now if somebody is listening there, what exactly were you saying in five bullet points? Wow, I don't know if I can do it in five <laughs> bullet points. But essentially, yeah. the definition of statelessness is right. very important. Yes. If you're not recognized as a citizen of any country under yeah. its laws, you are stateless. There's a difference between being undocumented and um, and being stateless. Mm -hmm. If you are stateless, there are organizations like Lawyers for Human Rights that mm -hmm. can help you um, with that situation. It's not in the best interest of anyone or you know, in the human rights um, interest for someone to be stateless because of the consequences that it can yeah. have. Um, furthermore, anyone can be stateless. It's not a migrant issue, it's not a refugee issue. In South Africa, South Africans are affected by this problem, and so are migrants. Mm -hmm. And it's everyone's responsibility to take measures to try and address statelessness. It's everyone's responsibility to raise awareness about this problem so that we can have um, you know, adequate interventions from our countries to assist people in this situation. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Viewers at home, this is Dr. Nisi Chisi. Now that you know who you are, now that you know which country you belong to, please take that step and make sure you find a solution. It's not costing anything, it's only your time. For the sake of the children, make sure you receive those documents, make sure you sit for those documents in order for you to belong somewhere. This project is called Hashtag I2Belong. This is Dr. Nessie. Thank you very much.